Well, hello once again, everybody, and I just want to welcome everyone else that's watching online. And uh, can we just welcome, because uh, we just sometimes edit this part out, there be other stuff. Can we welcome our folks who are watching online and say hello to them? And so I um, just want to say thank you for watching, and I want to let you know that God loves you. We'd love to have you come to our living room, and so we're so glad that you can join us today, wherever you are watching, perhaps later on, perhaps 10 years from now, who knows? So God bless you. Well, we are in the middle of a series called It Is Written, and uh, I want to encourage you that this is, a series is very important uh, for several different reasons, because we believe the Word of God is very important, that we understand what the Bible is. The Bible is the final authority of the church, of the true church in that regard, that we believe this is the Word of God. It doesn't just contain the Word of God, it's our final authority decision making comes from here and you'd say well why come on let's be real uh, you guys that, that's nice and everything but come on a bunch of guys got their hands all over it so how can you trust it I mean how can you trust this thing let's be real we, we got scientific method now we have authenticity we have carbon dating and all that so you can't really measure if this is really true or not and so it's just another book among many there's some good stuff in there but you really can't come on let's be real come, it's, it's 2020 soon to be, and you really can't trust it. Well, I have good news for you, that we're going to look at the Bible, as we've been doing, and show you that indeed it is the Word of God, and there's more evidence to support that it is the Word of God, empirical evidence, some of it's scientific evidence, historical evidence, that the Bible you have in your hands is authentic, authentic. Not only that, but the truth of it's what's inside the, the Bible as well. So we're going to get into that today, and also in this series, I'm really excited about it, we're also going to show about how you can trust the Bible, and then we're going to help you learn how to read the Bible for yourself. How's that sound? Yeah? We're going to be good. We're going to help you to learn to read the Bible for yourself. It's not that difficult as people make it out to be. And so I want to just review a couple of things that are fundamental to our series, and number one is this. The most powerful source in the universe, in every realm, is the very Word of God. It's the Word of God is the most powerful source in the universe. For example, it says in John 1, 1, and also Genesis, in the beginning was God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh. So the Word became flesh, which is Jesus Christ, and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So, the most powerful source in the universe in every realm is the Word of God, and Jesus is the Word and the foundation of all things. The reason I can walk on this stage, what we talked about, is the molecules are moving at such a rate of speed that it's a solid because there is a force, there's the Spirit of Christ that literally is in the stage, it's in the air, it holds it all together. That sounds like new age. No? Well, I'll tell you what it is. For by Him, that's Jesus, all things were created in heaven and on earth visible and in invisible all things are created through him and for him now check this out and he is before all things who so he was and you know he was before it all happened who's the who's the prime mover it's god he's the one who spoke the universe into existence and he is before all things and in him check this out all things what hold together all right, now science is telling us now there is a constant in the universe. There's some energy thing or something, dark matter, whatever it is. We don't know what it is, but something holds it all together. We don't know what it is. Well, the Bible said it millennials ago and said Spirit of Christ holds it all together. Now, isn't it interesting that a theological point has scientific reality to it, that what the Bible is describing here is what science is now telling us, everybody, that there is something that holds it all together. It's the Word of God, and that the Spirit of Christ holds it all together. Together. Not only does he hold the universe together, but he'll hold your mind together, he'll hold your house together, he'll hold your finances together, he'll hold everything together. If we conform to his pattern, his signature, God's grace is on your life through relationship with Jesus Christ. It's amazing. Okay, now that being said, within the Word of God, these 66 books of the Bible, which we're going to break down and explain to you in the coming weeks, we believe that not only the Word of God is, this is the Word of God. It is our final authority. It's not the complete Word of God because the Word of God holds the universe together, but what's in the Bible is complete. And so we're going to get into that 
in a little bit later. So I want to encourage you with that. And we went into a great, greater detail a couple of weeks ago about this. We fleshed it out. But I want to get back to what we're talking about today. And uh, this is Jesus speaking. He says, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, who's the word? Okay. He who what, hears, it means does, right? And puts them into practice is like the wise man who built his house upon the rock. So Jesus is basically saying that when the storms come, if you will live by this, not by your thoughts, not by your feelings, not by what culture says, not by what some other person is doing, but if you will hear the word and do what it says, put it in the practice. When stuff happens, everyone else will be falling, but guess who will be standing? I'm still standing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm not a Christian, I know, I'm a, I'm a heathen. But anyhow, the, the truth of that song is there. You'll still be standing no matter what's going on. Why? Because your ha life is built upon the solid rock of Jesus Christ. Nothing can shake the word of God. Heaven and earth will pass away. Political parties, thank God, will pass away. But the word of God never passes away. The same word that created the universe is the same word that's in here. It's supernatural. It's life. And I want to encourage you with that today. However, anyone who hears these words and does not do them is a fool. Now, why is there such chaotic, cataclysmic stuff going on in our culture today? People are like, we don't need this. <laughs> and we're basically jackhammering the foundation of what holds our society together. We're not talking about theocracy. We're just talking about common sense. The Bible is amazing. And so when, uh, we, we expect our culture to do that, okay? That's their job. They, they don't know Jesus Christ yet. But the church, hello, we should be solid on this thing, everybody. So when people ask you, what's your view on, on sexuality? What's your view on money and giving? What's your view on science and religion? What's your view on what it means to be a family? What's the role of a man and a woman? Guess what it comes up to here? It's this. It's not the culture. Okay, it's the Word of God. So we have to get to the point in place where we actually believe the Word of God. Yeah, but that's based upon your interpretation. Well, we're going to show you through the coming weeks about how do you interpret the Bible correctly. And I will tell you this as a general rule. If you have to make the Bible go through a bunch of hoops and stuff like that to make it say what you want it to say, it probably isn't the truth. Usually the Bible is flat out true. You don't have to make it twist it around. Oh, in this passage it means this and you have to weave it around and try to make something out of something. No, that's not what it's about. Usually the Bible is flat out clear about the essentials, okay? So we're going to get into that. So I'm, I'm, I'm pumped about this because that's what my job is, is to help you to become self sustaining believers, to know how to read the Bible yourself, that when I'm preaching up here you're checking it out and saying, hmm and I'm not quite sure about that, and I'd be happy if you come to me and say, hey, listen, I have concerns about what you preached about. Okay, what's your concern? I don't like it. I'm, I'm sorry. No, no, look what the Bible says here. I'm cool with that. And that's good, okay, because I'm going to miss it once in a while. So we should be students of the Bible and walk in the Word, live in the Word. That's important. We want to help you to be able to read the Word of God yourself, understand it, and have an experience with God and let His Word touch your heart. That you come to church, that you're equipped. That's my job. Not to come, we talked to them last week, not about coming to church and being a, a store or a commercial center to get what you want and go home. No, this is, this is a, a family that's supposed to work together, to grow together, and to encourage each other, all right? So, everyone who hears these words. Now, the question is for today is can I trust the Bible? After all, a bunch of guys got their hands all over it. Someone told me this past week, I loved it. Uh, and, and they were telling me, you know, Pastor, I really appreciate you doing this because I always thought that you can't trust the Bible because a bunch of guys got their hands all over it. <laughs> okay, I like that. that. That's a good quote. And, and I said, man, I'm going to use that if you don't mind. <laughs> so it's true. A lot of people think that way. And, and they say this. So listen, let's be real for a moment. You, you line up 20 people in this room. And if I told the first person, say, listen, Johnny climbed the apple tree uh, and picked an apple and bit it three times and then fell and broke his right leg. Now you go tell every person in that line to get to the 20th person. By the time you get to the 20th person, Johnny has a pear tree and he has a bionic leg. So, you know, that's just what happens, right? So you're saying, if we cannot do that in the natural way, I'm driving the camera and make people crazy behind there. I'm sorry, guys. Thank you for following. Can we just thank the camera guys this morning? Thank you. And uh, if you would like to help, help us with that, we would love to have you help with the cameras, that we can make a difference together. 
and, and reach out. We have a bunch of folks that actually have watched us online for a series of time, came to, came to, came to Jesus Christ in this place, and are now actively and participating because they watched online. So it's an opportunity. So if you want to help us, we would love it. Okay, can I trust the Bible? Okay, here we go. Number one, how can you trust the Bible? The Bible is true. Well, how do you know it's true? We just talked about you can't, it's fabricated, right? You can't, it's something put together. You really can't trust the Bible, right? It's, it's a story was fabricated. It's kind of made up and, you know, it, it's like a fishing story. It's embellished upon or, you know, it's uh, too much time has gone by. Yeah, let's be honest. It's 2,000 years and really a, a man went into a, a belly of a fish? Come on, really? Come on, let's be real. Jesus walked in the water. Sure he did. You know, he had the Noah and the ark, mm-hmm. Come on, that's, that's a nice, I like it for my kid's room. Actually, it's a pretty sadistic story to put in your kid's room. You really think about the significance of Noah and the ark. Anyhow, that's for another time. But too much time has gone by. We can't trust the Bible. Oh, the story was embellished. It's like those fishing stories. I caught a little bass, and the next thing, the bass gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And I like those golfing stories that some of you like to tell, right? Or, or you like preacher's illustrations that get bigger and bigger and exaggerate. Not this guy, but other pastors do that. I'm better than that. Um, let's move forward. <laughs> but the question is, is the Bible true? Is the Bible true? And I, I want to just encourage you because I don't know if you've noticed this, but in the universities of America and around the world for that matter, the, the Bible's under great attack. I mean, they're challenging the Bible. They call it hate speech if you believe the Bible. You can't even read the Bible in certain places of the world. It gets considered hate speech. And um, this is very much the case in um, in the universities, I heard of a college professor in a university that was saying, how many believe in God? Uh, about five people raised their hand out of 40. He says, okay, I'm going to prove you that God does not exist. You need to let go of that antiquated thing. This is what he said. He said, hey, God, if you're really real, come knock me over in the next 15 minutes. He said, okay, good. Goes on five minutes, goes, oh, come on, God. He's taunting God. He's taunting God. You can't knock me over, God. You can't do that. Every minute went by, he kept getting more and more. And about that time, a 300-pound football player heard it. He rushed in there, put his shoulder against the guy, and knocked him off his platform. And the guy said, the professor got up and said, what in the world would you do that for? The player replied, God said he was busy, so he sent me. <laughs> okay, I tried all morning to get that right. I had to write that one down. Okay, I'm trying to be funny. Okay. I, I, by the way, the Bible says uh, joy it does a heart like medicine. So I think a church should be a place where we can have fun and learn at the same time. All right? But the story was embellished. This is the truth here. All scholars agree the Apostle Paul lived. The Apostle Paul. Who's the Apostle Paul? The Apostle Paul was basically a terrorist in the Jewish church. His name used to be Saul. And he used to persecute ch um, Christians. He was a terrorist. Horrible man. And so, well, why do you call him Paul? God changed his name. But let me just go ahead. All scholars, all even atheist scholars, believe the Apostle Paul lived. Now, who's the Apostle Paul again? Paul wrote 13 letters in the New Testament. 13 letters. A third of your New Testament was written by the Apostle Paul. Under, we believe, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Okay? 13 letters. Also, Paul's letters were written in the 50s and the 60s. No, no, no. Not the 50s and the 60s of our decades. I'm talking 50s, 60s A.D. And they are earlier than the Gospels in the New Testament. So, or even earlier than Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John came the Paul's epistles were earlier. So it's some of the earliest writings of the Bible that we have today. In fact, it's astounding when you look at it it says in 1 Corinthians 15.1, it says this. Now, I, this is the Apostle Paul speaking here. Now, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel. Gospel means good news. I preached to you which you receive and which you stand. Remember we talked about standing in the word of God, right? All right. And that, let me see, did I miss it here? There we go. And that he appeared to Cephas, which is Peter, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than what? Five hundred brothers at one time okay most of whom are still alive though some have fallen asleep not like you guys in church I mean they actually died okay you're not gonna fall asleep in church now let me show you a little a graphic here to help us to put it in perspective first Corinthians was written in 55 AD all right Paul wrote it to the Corinthian church 
20 years after Jesus ascended into heaven and rose again from the dead. 20 years. It's not a long, 20 years is not a very long time, is it? If you're 20 years old, 20 years old is a long time. But if you're 70 years old, it was last week. All right? So Jesus went on to heaven at 35 AD or so. All right? So we're talking about a 20-year period. But that's not all. Check this out. Paul visited Corinth in 52 AD, 15 years after Jesus. He visited Corinth, and then he wrote a letter to them afterwards. All right? Still not done. Also, 12 years after Jesus went to heaven, he met the disciples in Jerusalem. And here is a narrative of that. He actually talks about it in Galatians. He says, then after three years, after his experience with God in the road of Damascus, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas, which is the apostle Peter, and remained with him 15 days, but I saw none other, none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's physical brother, who wrote the book of James, who was the early church leader. He was a Jerusalem church leader, the head elder, if you will. So he says he went, through, he went to Jerusalem. So we have 12 years he met the disciples. Now, we're not done yet. There's more, okay? Then the apostle Paul met the church after five years, at, how many remember what happened five years ago? I remember what happened five years ago, don't you? Absolutely. Well, five, five years into Christianity, when Christ went into heaven, guess the apostle Paul was persecuting the church and he saw the first martyr of the church, Stephen, getting stoned, not by drugs, by stones. Okay, let me make that clear. And he died, he was the first martyr in the church. And guess who was there? Apostle Paul was there. So now we have a relationship to the events that took place within five years. And he's writing what he sees. So that's incredible. A lot of the great works that we have, Plato, and a lot of the, um, the different history books, there's like a thousand years, 500 years difference between when it happened and when it took place. And they go by eyewitness accounts, they go by oral tradition, they go by fragments, and they have these histories which we deem as historically accurate, yet the Bible blows them away hands down. I could bore you and show you a bunch of examples, but I'm not going to do that today. I'm just telling you it's the truth, and you can see it for yourself. Not right now, however. So get off your Google. All right, here we go. And then in the early church, we had a creed. This is not the grunge, post-grunge band from the 90s. I'm talking about an actual creed. Okay, what was the creed? Which is, means a, an agreement of what it's about. All two of you got that. Okay, for I delivered to you as of the first importance what I received. This is the Apostle Paul saying, this is a creed. He actually speaks a creed that was common to the early church at the time of the writing of this. He's actually proclaiming what has been said to the early church, okay? So here we have a creed that actually predates his writing this. So, I also received, here it is, here's the creed. Christ died, in other words, it was almost like a poetic thing. You'd say it, our country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, you know, kind of like that. Or, um, you know, you say something that has a cadence to it as you remember it. Well, they used to have these cadence and rememberings so you could repeat theology, all right? which is a whole nother thing about oral tradition we don't have time today to talk about. But here is the creed. This is what people learn. Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the 12. So they, they learn this creed as we can move on. So can you trust the Bible. Yes, you can, because the Bible is true. Prove it to me. I'll do my very best. I can't prove 100%, but I will tell you flat out that there's more evidence for the Bible than any ancient document that being authentic. Not only that, but my friends, it's true, and there's a variety of reasons for it. It still takes a measure of faith, but I'll, I'll, I'll propose this to you. It takes more faith to believe it's not the Word of God than it is. I'm convinced of that, and not just me. Not just me. So, then we come to a man by the name of Luke. Okay? Now, who's Luke? Luke, besides being my son, Luke, who we named him after, incidentally, Luke was a physician. Okay? A very detail-oriented person. When you have a physician, you want your physician to be detail-oriented. Do I need to explain that out to you? Why? Okay. So, the, the, the Luke, what he did, he was like an investigative reporter. He was hired by a guy by the name of Theopolis 
to go out and do research about, about Jesus, to put an orderly account. Why? Because there was a lot of stories raising up that were false. And so he was trying to get it right. So here we go. Many have undertaken, Luke chapter 1, verse 1. He actually talks about how he does it. We actually have the, the, the research methodology he used. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. Just as they were handed down to us, they were handed down how? How did they hand it down? By those from the first. From the first who were what? Eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Let me explain to you that the vast majority of the ancient world was not literate. They had something called oral tradition. And I'm amazed by this because the memory of people in those days was so developed in that culture, it was incredible. Let me give you a case in point. My grandfather, William Harkov, who's now in heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, was a, an engineer German. And uh, I remember in the 1970s that calculators, Texas Instruments started making calculators. They were like $200. That's a lot of money back. That's a lot of money today. Back then, it's like a 1200 bucks. And he had a calculator. But he was so quick with math. I could throw numbers at him. What's 635 times 25? Boom! He pumped it out. So we could not punch it quick enough on the calculator. He would get it before we could even punch it out. It's amazing. So what he would do, <laughs> let's do this. He would do a mathematical equation at work doing his books. And then he would, he, he would use a calculator, but he would use his mind to make sure the calculator was correct. Uh, believe me, I'm nothing like that. I, if I go to McDonald's, I'm lost without the drawer. Anyhow, beside the point, I'm just kidding. But the point is this. That part of the human mind is developed because it had to be. In, in ancients, oral tradition was so incredible. People would memorize. I mean, some of you had to memorize the Gettysburg Address. I don't think they do that anymore. But they would memorize. And the Pharisees memorized the first five books of the Old Testament. I mean, Genesis, Le Le Leviticus, Numbers, run five books. It was not unheard of of people to recite long dissertations verbatim. Okay? So that's one thing. I hope you're tracking with me. Just like we got books today, they had memories that worked. <laughs> today, we're a mess. <laughs> we, without our phones, we're, we're done, right? You got to add, hey, Siri, or hey, Google. Anyhow, or Alexa. Just as they were... Uh, oh. Is anyone's phone going off right now? I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that. All right. Just as they were handed down to us by those from whom were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. All right. With this in mind, now we go back to this. Now we're going back to Luke. Okay. With this in mind, since I myself have what? Carefully did what he did to do, investigated. Listen, God is fine with you investigating if Christianity is really true. Now let me tell you, the Bible makes your promise. If you search with me with all your heart, you will find me. Now, if you try to find loopholes in Christianity so you can do what you want, you're not going to find God. But if you sincerely want to know God, it's a promise you can find Him. So, with this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account because there's other accounts that have been done as well. You most excellent Theopolis, who's the person that helped finance his research brief. So why? Why did Luke do this? So that you may know the what? Certainty of the things you have already been taught. All right? So you see that. He did the research. He was a research brief. He researched uh, a documentary of that day, if you will. This is what he did. Now, as we look at this, the prevailing wisdom in modern culture is, if you talk to people like the Huffington Post, every time I read them out of breath, but the Huffington Post, that was, okay, thank you so much. One person got it. Jesus, this is what people believe, and I read an article in the Huffington Post, which is not a Bible-believing publication or now online magazine. After Jesus died, it's what they believe, I'm actually quoting, many legends circulated orally, and that is how they grew. Okay? So, many legends circulated orally, and that's how they grew. And you can't trust what someone says, and finally they were written down, and we have many gospels today. We have the gospel of uh, Mary Magdalene, 
We have the book of Enoch. We have all these other books. We have all these other gospels that are out there. But what they did, <laughs> you see, a bunch of white guys got together and they said, hey, we're going to control and we're going we're to colonize the world and white is right. And by the way, we're all white. And by the way, did you know that Jesus was not white? He was olive skin, dark skin. He had brown eyes. Okay? And not, not only that, he wasn't from a privileged class. He was from the outcast. He was under subjection of the Roman government. And he was so poor that his parents couldn't pay for an offering. They had to use a bird. So he wasn't any of those things, all right? But finally, they were written down. And we had many gospels. The gospels of... So what has happened with that? And this is what happened. 300 years later, the powers that be, Constantine, when he made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire, and by the way, it's true, that did happen. He saw a dream, conquer with this, and he took a cross. And this is when Christianity was doing, was doing great in many ways, but when, once it became entwined with politics, it was a disaster. Christianity and politics should watch out for each other, but they can't get together. It's a mess. Incidentally, you talk to some Muslims in the Middle East today, they still remember the Crusades, which was done by the Catholic Church that was like this, Roman Catholic Church, which became one with the Roman government. And so I don't have time to go through it all right now, but they believe that Constantine said, okay, let's control this thing. Let's get rid of these other Gospels. Let's compile something that we could conquer the world with, the Gospels. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the other ones, get them away. Let's cut them on the editing floor. Let's put them on the, we, we're not going to put those. We're only going to put these four because we're going to control. A lot of folks would believe that. And that isn't true at all. That is not true at all. In fact, what we see here is this. There's actually a book that I, I got some of this from. Uh, Richard uh, Buckman has this, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses. The Gospels as Eyewitness Testimony. He goes into the ancient word of how um, eyewitness accounts. I hope I'm not boring you too much. Are you guys okay? Can we do a little teaching in church once in a while? Okay. We'll get into the word a little more, but we need to understand these things. He talks about how, what happened. Bibliography in that day was eyewitnesses. All right? So you could talk about that. So if you quote somebody and you quote who the person is, you can go to the person and verify. So what you normally do today is if you read... Uh, you do a dissertation, you read an article, you see the footnote, the footnote says, gives you the source, you go look at the source, you can find where the original source was, which, which what they quoted from. Back in that day, your bibliography was eyewitnesses, so you could go check and ask the person. And I do this all the time in my house. The kids will say, mom said I could do this. They quote mom. So guess what I do? I go to the eyewitness. I said, honey, did you really say? No, I did not say that. <laughs> yeah, you all laugh because it happened to everybody, right? So that's what you do to eyewitness. Well, that's what they did back in those days. Watch this. Check this out. Historians value eyewitness testimony. They really do. And as we look at the scriptures, look at this. I'm going to show you some scriptures that show eyewitnesses, all right? Here we have in Mark a certain man from Cyrene, Simon, all right? The father of Alexander and Rufus was passing by on his way from the country and they forced him to carry the cross of Jesus. So that's what it's So you hear that in, in Mark and guess what you can now do? Mark actually gives the guy's name. So you can go, to, where's this guy Simon? Oh, there's a bunch of Simons. No, not Simon from American Idol. I'm talking about Simon, the Alexanders and Rufus. Oh, Alexander and Rufus. Oh, Simon. Oh, he's over there. You talk to Simon. Did you carry Jesus' cross? Yeah, I did. You can verify the story at the time because it was written down. Then Simon Peter, another scripture, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Let's find this guy Malchus. Did he really cut his ear off? Where's Malchus? <laughs> you don't want to talk to Malchus. Why? Well, he got paid off by the Romans. But yeah, I was there. I saw it. Peter chopped off his ear and then Jesus healed it. Really? Yeah. Where's Malchus? There's Malchus. Hey, Malchus, how you doing? Can I see your pierced ear? <laughs> Not pierced anymore. He, 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 he did a good job for me. So you can find Malchus and, and verify the story. All right, let's look again. Mark chapter 10. As Jesus and his disciples together with a large crowd were leaving the city, a blind man by the name of who? Bartimaeus 
which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. Okay, where's this blonde man? Bl blonde man. Blind man. Uh, his name is Bartimaeus. Let's find this guy Bartimaeus. So you find Bartimaeus. Hey, Bartimaeus, how you doing? He opened a, a glasses store, an ophthalmology shop. <laughs> Selling sunglasses. Sunglasses hut. Hey, <laughs> you're, buying your, you're buying your Oakleys or whatever. And he says, hey, ha or, or Maui's. But anyhow, you go there and you talk to Bartimaeus. And Bart hey, man, how you doing? I love selling sunglasses. Jesus healed me. He healed me. And I can see. Really? Oh, yeah, what happened? I was begging on the side of the road. And he came by and he healed me. And I can see today. You could talk to Bartimaeus and sunglasses. Mark chapter 16. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, who had seven demons out of her, six or seven demons out of her, Mary, the mother of James and Salmon, brought spices so that they might go and anoint Jesus' body. Now, that's significant. Why? Guess who the first eyewitness was to the resurrection of Jesus? Guess who it was? Women. Yeah, so what? So what? Do you know in the ancient civilizations of that time, in the Jewish culture, that a, and even some of the Roman culture, that a woman's testimony was not seen as valid? A woman's testimony, a slave's testimony, and a child was not admissible in court. So if you're going to prove a point, you're not going to have a woman's testimony. If you're going to make up a false religion, and the authenticity of it, why on earth would you put a woman down as the first person to see it? Why? I'll tell you a reason why. Because Jesus was the greatest woman liberator that ever was. And so all this bunk about the Bible holds women down. Are you kidding me? The Bible championed women like no other document, no other religion. Even the Old Testament championed women over the surrounding cultures around them. Now, was everything reported in the Old Testament God's will? No. You can see what his will was and how man messed it up. But you can, what Jesus did to women. Incredible. The first witness, the first evangelist in the Bible was a woman. The woman at the well. The first evangelist. And she just got saved and she was sleeping with five or six different guys. Hello. Jesus champions women. So anyone says it holds women back. It does not hold women back. It actually exonerates and actually empowers women. So you, here you have... These people now, all right, and verse 20, uh, Luke church 20, excuse me, Luke 24, verse 10, it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. They're the ones that told the story. Hello, how can this possibly be? And so what happened was they didn't know and believe the report. And so you have these two guys on the road to Emmaus, which is a city. They're walking from Jerusalem to go to Emmaus. They're, they're distraught, they're upset. They thought Jesus was going to come and kick the Romans' tail and reestablish the Davidic monarchy. The Messiah was going to come. We're going to rule with an iron fist and we're going to take back what's right for us. The glory days of Solomon and David are going to even be better. Praise God. Jesus the Messiah. All of a sudden, Jesus basically disappoints them. He's, what they thought he was going to do, he didn't end up doing. And they missed what he was doing. Listen to this. One of them named Cleopas asked him, Jesus, okay, they were walking along the road to Emmaus. They're in an HOV lane. And Jesus is in a ride share with them. Hey, can I come with you guys? So they're in an HOV lane and they're doing a ride share, okay? And they're going, and they're walking on Emmaus, and these guys are talking. Jesus is like sitting there going, okay, what's going on, guys? These guys are so distraught. These guys are so fixated upon what they think God should do that they can't see what God did. Can I just give you a caution? As we're entering the last days, there's so many people in the church that haven't figured it out. Pre-trip, post-trip, mid-trip. They have it so figured out that if Jesus came and did anything different, we would persecute Jesus himself. How can you say that? Because it's exactly what they did when Jesus came the first time. And I have a funny feeling it's going to happen again. Do we believe in eschatology and the second coming of Christ? Yes. But be careful not to quarantine God to a little thing that you want, that you end up persecuting what he's doing in your life. And this is what was going on here. These guys are so distraught. Plus, Jesus had a glorified body. You know, he could walk through walls and eat fish and all that. A glorified body, very much similar to my glorified body. But I'm just kidding. I'm far from glorified. All right. That's why I wear a vest to hide the glorification of my midsection. <laughs> 
I'm just kidding. No, I'm not. All right. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened to these days? You see, the difference between historical composition and eyewitness testimony is detailed perspective. Please understand that this is very credible in that day. It is the bibliography. It is a, uh, the historical record. It's something, a fact finder. Okay, this is how you knew through eyewitnesses. We go to 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 6. I want to show you again. Here's the Apostle Paul speaking. What does he say? After that he appeared. That's Jesus. Appeared to who? More than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time. Most of whom are still living. When he wrote this in 55 AD, you could talk to the eyewitnesses, although some have fallen asleep. Not the ones in church today. I'm talking about those that have died. Okay? They're people you can talk to, everybody. You see that? It's the bibliography. It's the fact finders can happen. And so even in, we found a, a little, not we, but our uh, archaeologists found P-52, which is not a, a, a bomber. P-52 is Papyrus 52. And what it was, they found some fragments of, of a gospel from 110 AD. Okay? We have gospels that are 50 or 60 AD, sections of them, and this came later, and they both agree. And I can show you later on the, the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is another topic for another time as well, which is uh, something different. Okay. L let me say something else. Fact. <laughs> Most of the Gnostic Gospels that make the cutting room floor were written years after. So in other words, why weren't these other Gospels in that? Why was not uh, the book of Mary Magdalene there? Why? Because it was hundreds of years later than the actual events. And... The, uh, thematically, it completely is, doesn't even line up at all to the rest of the Bible. In addition to that, the Gospels were written, so all were written in the lifetime of the litany, uh, living eyewitnesses. They saw it. They were alive. And when they died, the church fathers said, yeah, I knew Peter. I have a whole section of the, if it, my computer, I have all the church fathers. I actually read and they talk about the apostles who they personally knew. And they talk about the gospels. They don't talk about the book of Mary Magdalene. These were Gnostic gospels. What are Gnostic gospels? What does that mean? Gnostic is Gnosko, secret knowledge. And you know how you can smell a cult? Very easy. When anyone has secret knowledge, you know that something's wrong. Freemasons, I'm sorry to step on some toes, but they have these secret things that do. Or Mormons, they have secret ceremonies. Cults have a secret, the privileged class. Christianity, you know what Jesus does at that totem pole? He kicks the thing over and he puts it through a grinder and he shreds it all. Because what happens is this. It's accessible to everybody. Shut up from the house tops. We don't have a secret gospel. We speak it plainly. Cults have secret knowledge, a Scientology, or even um, pay the money and you'll know more. See that cult, 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 cult. Any church that says, We are the only one, mm -hmm, cult. <laughs> I'm just telling you. Okay, you follow me, everybody? Okay, so the Gospels were written, so all in the lifetime of living eyewitnesses. So people say, Yeah, they were consolidating power by putting these Gospels together. It doesn't make any sense. Why would they choose these Gospels to make their point? It does not make any sense at all. Why? Why? Because the shame and honor culture would not have had accepted that. You have to understand, my, my sister-in-law is from Japan, and in their culture, they have something called saving face. Okay? This didn't just come in recent days. This comes from millennials ago. So in the time of Jesus, you have the Middle Eastern culture. It was all about saving face and honor and all that. You, you dishonor somebody, it's a big problem, all right? So, the shame and honor culture was a big deal. So why would you select a gospel that would completely knock that off and, and actually show dishonor and show weakness? For example, the Bible is amazing. The Bible shows... Oh, I'm getting late here. Holy mackerel. I need to wrap this up, everybody. Okay, let me wrap this up. I just, people are getting up and I'm looking at the clock and I'm, getting, I'm having too much fun up here. Let me, uh, let me wrap, wrap this up in the next uh, five minutes. Okay, so anyhow, um, Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, right? We have all these various things. 
It talks about the prophets have spoken. Um, we also see, don't believe the Bible because it's exciting. You know, a lot of people say, I believe the Bible because it's exciting. Uh, that's not the only reason, everybody. Or how about this? Don't believe the Bible because it's relevant. It will meet your needs. It will meet your, help you be a better parent, a better business leader. It will make you happy. Don't believe the Bible for that. Believe the Bible because it's true. Believe the Bible because it happened. Believe it because it's true. And only if it happened and if it's true will it meet your needs. The Bible is true. The Bible is true. The Bible is true. The Bible is the truth about a man. It's about Jesus from Genesis to Revelation. It's about Jesus. Moses was a great deliverer, a type of Christ, a historical figure that's true, but pointed to Jesus who would deliver his people. He says, I, God will raise up a prophet like me who would deliver you. Here comes Jesus. You see the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire. There's another man in the fire. We sing that song. It was Jesus. We see this various things happening. We see the Noah and the ark, for example. And Jesus is the ark as destruction came. Those who are in the ark are saved. Those who put their faith in Christ are saved. You can see Jesus throughout the scriptures. The whole Bible is about Jesus. And Jesus says to the guys on the road to Emmaus, O oh, foolish ones and slow to heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things? And he explained them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. I would have loved to have heard that conversation. I'm sure he read Isaiah 53. I'm sure he read Psalm 22. I'm sure he read about the rich man and they um, buried in a rich man's tomb and how they they cast lots for his grave clothes. I'm sure they wrote about all these things in Daniel who predicted when Christ would come to the very year. I'm sure that he did all that. You see, this is the truth. Culture. I don't know about the Son of God stuff, but Jesus was a great teacher. Really? You know what Jesus says? I'm going to go quickly through it. I don't have time to go for right now. Okay, Jesus says, if your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. He who looks at a woman with lust in his heart has already committed adultery. <laughs> Give me a break. What? what? <laughs> What a male chauvinist that is. He's making the woman the bad woman. He's not talking about that. Talk about the heart, right? So, and, and, and um, people read that today. They say, that's insane. That's insane what the Bible's saying. That's not right. It's not popular. It's not pretty. The Bible, you look at the Bible, you realize what a wreck you are in that aspect. Jesus says, be perfect as your family father is perfect. You see, <laughs> if you read the Bible as a bunch of true statements and are not devastated, you're not really reading it. In fact, you love Mark, Mark Twain. It ain't the parts of the Bible that I can't understand that bother me. It's the parts that I do not understand. It's the parts that I do understand, <laughs> right? At this time, what we're going to do in a few moments is talk about, I'm going to, uh, at this time, if you could just raise your hand, those that need any communion elements, we're going to prepare ourselves as I wrap this up. I'm sorry, everybody, was having too much fun. Um, let's go ahead and, and raise your hand real big if you don't have the communion elements and you want them the ushers will go ahead and get it for you and uh, I thank you everybody for being patient with me I had a sermon within the sermon today about worship so I kind of ate some of my time away um, but anyhow I wanted to just finish with this alright every story every law I got it everything is about Jesus so the Bible is true the Bible is the truth about a man Jesus and check this out everybody it's important the Bible is truth for the heart not just the mind not just the mind I want to show you something as we conclude this time here together the Bible is truth back to the road of Emmaus. These two guys are walking with Jesus. As they approached the village which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he was going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us for it's nearly evening and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread and he gave thanks and broke it and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were open and real recognized him he disappeared from their sight so when he broke it open oh, that's Jesus 
They finally got it. Why? What brings enlightenment is what Jesus did on the cross. He broke the power of sin and death. He creates a pathway to God Almighty. And they asked himself, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked to us? Maybe some of your hearts were burning today during the worship. And you know that God's calling you to, your, to yourself, to himself. Christ is calling you, give your life to me. And you're like, no, 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 I can't, I can't. God says, let go. Give me your life. Maybe you used to walk with God and you turned away. I can't think of a better time I say every week than now is the day of salvation. I ask you to close your eyes and bow your head, please. Have you given your life to Jesus Christ? I mean really given your life to Christ. No caveats. I'm, I'm going head first. I'm going to follow him. Have you made that decision? Or maybe you did make that decision and you took it back. You took the ownership back, and now you're doing it your own way all over again. Today's the day to give your life for the first time or get right with God. So I better know how to pray. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand so I can see it. And when I meet your eye, then I'll you put it down. And one today would say, Pastor, I want to give my life to Christ for the first time. Or I want to get back right. I've walked away. Today's the day. Come on. Anyone this morning would say that? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Wow, a lot. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Okay, good. Praise God. We're all in the same boat together, everybody. Okay, I want you to pray this prayer with me in your heart. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I believe you are the Son of God, and I believe you rose again from the dead. I ask you right now to forgive me all the things I've ever done wrong, both known and unknown. Thank you that I am free now of all sin. And today, I step down from being the boss of my life. I resign. Jesus, you are number one, and I will follow you the best way I can. Come fill me now with your spirit that I can walk the way you have for me today. Thank you that I am now your child.